Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this webinar organized for the Crown Modeling Community of Practice. This is Annabel Molero. I'm coordinating the Crown Modeling Community of Practice uh, together with uh, the crop uh, leader, Matthew Reynolds, who is also here. Um, I see many people are joining from different parts of the world, so uh, welcome to everyone. I see that people are joining, so so welcome. Thanks for being here. I see we have already 57 participants. I'm very pleased to invite to welcome you to these sessions that we have organized also in collaboration with Diego Pequeno from CIMID about disease crop modeling advances and challenges for large scale simulation studies. This is the agenda we have for today. We have great speakers. Um, we are very happy that they accepted to do a presentation. So first, Diego Pequeno is going to do a brief introduction to the topic and the challenges. Um, then Timothy Krupnik from CIMIT Bangladesh and Jose Mauricio from Embrampa in Brazil are going to talk about the uh, wheat, uh, wheat um, blast uh, disease and how they, they, how they have developed and implemented um, some models to try to develop early warning systems for Bangladesh and Brazil. Then Carlo Montes from CIMIT in Mexico is going to present a large uh, scale assessment of climate sustainability for with, with blast in Asia. Then Simone Bregaglio from CREA in Italy is going to present uh, the evaluation of environmental sustainability of plant pathogens to the integration of disease and crop models from data needs to users cases and some challenges. And at the end, Jacob Smith from the University of Cambridge is going to present the forecasting with rust dispersal across South Asia, the challenges and approaches. After all these presentations, we will have the clarification round with the questions that you can write in the Q&A section. And at the end, if we have some time, because the, se the session will, will take up, uh, has to be two hours long, then we will open up a discussion panels with, the, with all the panelists and also with Christopher Gilligan uh, from the University of Cambridge that uh, has also joined. So then if you have questions, please type them. We will try to answer as many as possible. So thank you to all the speakers for accident to be agreeing to be here. And uh, Diego, I'm going to turn it over to you for starting the, to start in, uh, the presentation. Thank you to everyone. Okay, thank you. Hello everyone. Can you, can you hear me? Can you see my presentation? Yes, Diego, we can. Thanks a lot. Okay, so uh, my name is Diego Pequeno, wheat crop modeler from CIMIT, and uh, I'm gonna introduce the, the session on disease crop modeling advances and challenges for large scale simulation studies. So just uh, an outline of the brief presentation. Uh, I present some of the crop disease and food security aspects, uh, some challenges and some advances and opportunities that we are gonna uh, talk in, this, in these sessions. So especially uh, talking about some aspects of minimal data requirements using fair principles, integration of disease and crop growth models, successful applications of crop disease modeling, new technologies, and multidisciplinary approaches such as crop growth modeling integration with pests and disease modeling. Uh, for example, in large, large scale simulations, warning and forecast systems, crop damage assessment tools, and among others. So just one context of the, the importance of crop disease and food security. So it's, I think it's very uh, clear for, for everyone, uh, the importance that uh, the crop disease uh, are a major cause of hunger and uh, social upheaval threatening food security. So it's estimated that uh, crop pests and diseases are responsible for direct yield losses ranging between 20 and 40% of uh, global agricultural productivity and regularly uh, menace uh, global food security. And more than half of all emerging disease of plants are spread, spread by an introduction that we have seen. And in, in this map, we can see the, what, what happened that uh, it, it was uh, first uh, reported in Brazil in 1985, the wheat blast, in, in the case of the wheat blast, 
and then now it it is uh, it crosses the the continent and have been reported even in in Bangladesh and in African countries. So, and in the bottom here, you can see the, uh, the most recent uh, report of the scientists observing with blast in Zambia's uh, district. So um, here I present some of the challenges. So among many challenges that we have uh, to, that we can uh, name, so here we want to, to focus uh, a bit more on, on, on data. So data, the right type of data that we want to collect for these kind of simulations, the quality of data, the, the, the ways to share, following the fair, the findable access, accessibility, interoperability, and reuse of digital access principles, clear definition of minimum data requirement for crop and disease modeling simulations in the context of different research purposes, because sometimes uh, different uh, field uh, research uh, uh, trials, they have different purposes. And sometimes it's possible to, to collect some kinds of data. Others are uh, have different uh, priorities for de depending on the, on the context. And then uh, it's it's important to to define uh, what what is the minimal data requirement. So it's something that we want to discuss in this session. An improvement of crop and disease assessment and monitoring tools in terms of data quality and accuracy. So advancing opportunities. I just named some of the advancing opportunities that we that the panelists are gonna be talking about. So many global networks becoming available to monitor and, con and contain crop disease outbreaks, uh, upscale new technologies and uh, ground field data to regional assessment impacts using many technologies and, and approaches. Open source data sharing initiatives, uh, whether data being more accessible in space and time and new disease monitoring technologies, for example, remote sensing and satellite data, disease damage monitoring tools, uh, crop and disease mod modeling interactive simulations, and, and others. So thank you. With that, I'm gonna, uh, gonna hand it over to uh, Timothy and, and Jose Mauricio to present their and all the panelists. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. And we okay. see your screen. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, good. Um, thanks, Diego and, and everybody. Um, this is an exciting session, actually, because we have a couple of speakers that are talking about wheat blast, and then there's also a theme on wheat and wheat diseases from a modeling standpoint. Um, so it's great that we have so many people joining. Um, I'll be speaking with my colleague uh, Mauricio from Brazil about work that we've been doing in Bangladesh and Brazil on modeling wheat blast disease um, and developing early warning systems. What we'll go through in the presentation is a brief background on wheat blast in Brazil and then Bangladesh. We'll talk about the blast model structure we've been using, efforts in field uh, observations and spore trapping and use of secondary data for model validation. Um, and we'll talk about integrating the crop and disease models for spatial yield reduction assessments, which we're just getting started on. And then we'll talk about the practical application of all of this work, which is the, you know, taking the, all of the research that we've done and applying it and developing an early warning system to send messages to extension agents and farmers, warning them in advance of the risk of wheat blast outbreaks. And then we'll conclude. Mauricio. You're on mute. Okay, okay sorry about that. Well, uh, thanks to, to organizers. Okay, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, I will start with uh, explaining a little bit about situation of wheat blast in Brazil, uh, that pictures that we have there with the, uh, uh, the wheat field with the bleach, uh, uh, with spikes, spikes, okay, that was taken in 2009. And uh, since then we have uh, learning a lot about this, uh, what's the uh, environment about the disease, or what is the, uh, favorable conditions and also about the pathogen. Okay, we know that this pathogen can attack not only wheat, but many 
basses, okay, including some uh, weeds, other uh, forage crops. And especially here in Brazil, we have one uh, perennial forage crop that's called Brachiaria, okay, it's widely used and uh, it, it can host the pathogen. So we, we are expecting, we're almost sure that there is some kind of gene flowing between these isolates from these different species. So it, it, that makes the, the, the pathogen uh, uh, very complex. But uh, so the idea is that uh, uh, we have now is that maybe this, the source of inoculum, okay, from to the wheat fields, maybe from outside or near, uh, near uh, uh, crops or uh, that can provide all the inoculum for, for the uh, disease. Next, please. And on, sorry. So what I wanted to, we wanted to talk about was the movement of wheat blast and, and how it's affected South Asia in addition to Brazil. So wheat blast. Um, blast identified Let me just turn that off and mute this, and then we'll start over again. So wheat blast first that was found in Brazil in 1984 affects a large area. It moved to Bangladesh in 2016, affected about 1,500 hectares, with a reduction estimated between 25 and 30 percent. And some of our studies at CIMIT by colleagues have shown that it could result in significant potential losses to farmers' profits. Um, wheat blast typically spreads through, it can spread through infected seed, which is how it probably arrived in Bangladesh, but also through deposition from fungal lesions after sporulation and the movement of spores into the atmosphere. And you can also understand that there are environmental parameters that are set that can affect when the disease will actually occur and when de the deposition and then infection will occur that will actually um, cause a reaction in, in the plant. So, Mauricio? Okay. Uh... Initially, okay, the idea was to, to have a, a early warning system or a kind of a model that to can predict the occurrence of the disease. And initially, we start with uh, something that we call the time spore index model. It was a very simple uh, uh, function that uh, related to uh, air temperature and relative humidity. Uh, later, we uh, we learned that realized that we should need something more mechanistic. Uh, and so we, if we could try to say something like a quantitative way of uh, uh, estimating the risk. Uh, so we came out uh, with this idea of using a, a more complex model. Okay, so in a such a way that we try to simulate the number of uh, uh, air that are present in the atmosphere. Okay, so we, we are using a, 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 a a whole life uh, cycle uh, for a fungal. Okay, so this kind of models, they have lots of many parameters and, uh, but they, they can provide, can be very mechanistic. Next. Uh, here, just to have an idea about the diagram of the, this model, it's a, it's a complete life cycle model, okay, that uh, it, it, we try to take into account all the processes that happens in a, in a fungal uh, life cycle. And uh, particularly we have, we were talking about the inoculum, we have the, we treat the inoculum in this model uh, in three layers, okay? Uh, we call the layers that are in the organ, the layer, the inoculum that is in the plant and the inoculum that escaped from the docile is uh, in the atmosphere, okay? And that's the kind of inoculum, the, the one that is in atmosphere that we are interested in. Uh, okay, so we, we, we implement that model, uh, but uh, we would like to, to have it validated, okay? We had many uh, field uh, surveillance, uh, okay, in Bangladesh, uh, but uh, the disease, uh, okay, after 2016, the disease, uh, it showed up, but very low uh, incidence. So we decided to have also, besides this uh, field uh, surveillance, uh, to have uh, Spore uh, traps, okay, uh, so that we could monitor uh, the the number of spores in the air and make a comparison with our models. So we had uh, these spore traps uh, set up in two years, 
2018 and 19 in four different locations in Bangladesh. Uh, unfortunately, in both years, in all the locations, uh, the number of spores uh, they were present, they were present in a very low density. Okay, that make it a little bit difficult to, to compare with our models. Uh, but uh, then what we, we, in Bangladesh, we're using this kind of a rotor rod type of uh, spore trap. Uh, and uh, so alternatively, we found some secondary data set in the literature. Uh, there was this data set was uh, in Pennsylvania with magnum using logum. Uh, it's the same fungus, but a different host. Uh, so they have this uh, spore data uh, set with the uh, a spore trap called the seven day continuous spore trap, a cookart. And uh, so we managed to get the weather data from these uh, nearby locations. And uh, we, we run our model and compare the, the model outputs with the, the observed data. And uh, uh, there's two years in two locations. And at least in three occasions, okay, the, the model was, was pretty good, was reasonable well what we was observed, okay? So uh, we use a, a kind of uh, uh, a similarity index, okay? That's where zero is no match and one is a full match, okay? And the average, okay? One location had a 0.55 and the other locations was above uh, 0.7, okay? Given the, the difficulty that uh, is uh, uh, in this kind of modeling, I think it's, it's, it's acceptable what we have so far. Next. Uh, so we did some back testing. Okay, we implemented the model. Okay, now in the in this uh, system, and uh, we took one location in Bangladesh. Just an example here. Okay, it was uh, Boa. Okay, it's more south. Okay, this location. And uh, we have the weather data from these three years, okay, observed weather data, this data was provided by the Bangladesh Department of Meteorology. Uh, and you can see that uh, if you compare 2016 to 2017 and 18, there's, there's at least for temperatures, okay, the, the, the different pattern, okay, in these three years. And uh, in 2016, uh, the minimum and maximum temperature was that just the both panel with the red color and blue. Red is maximum temperature, blue is minimum temperature. Uh, and they were very close, the maximum and the minimum. So it means that uh, uh, days with, uh, okay, very cloudy days, okay, and the hell, our relative humidity was very high. Uh, and uh, so this kind of variables that enter uh, in the model as inputs, the temperature, relative humidity, precipitation, and uh, we, we compare the simulated. And uh, so in 2016, the same location was where uh, the uh, simulated number of spores, okay, in doing the, the susceptible window, okay, that's uh, maybe late January to uh, late March, okay. So you see that if you compare 2017 and 18 with 2016, we see these spikes in the uh, during that uh, that time of the year. That would mean that we would have condition lots of spores for uh, uh, infection uh, on the spikes that were present in the field in that year. So that was, and uh, this was was for one location, but that uh, was across all the locations that we have data in, in Bangladesh. And we have a similar situation here in Brazil with the years that. Uh, uh, we, we have observed uh, epidemics and no epidemics, and uh, we are using the same model. Uh, here, I'm just going to show you, uh, uh, we, we did the, uh, with the spark cloud, and uh, we are using data uh, from year five, okay, uh, our weather data uh, from 2016 and 2019 in Bangladesh for the wheat growing areas in Bangladesh. And if you can see that, especially in February, okay, we have seen some difference uh, in the, uh, uh, it seems that uh, was, there was the number of spores where comparing the other years, especially by beginning, uh, by the end of January to the middle of February was higher 
in 2016 the, uh, the other years. Here we are using uh, uh, weather data from where now is okay. It's we are not quite sure how good is the quality of, of this data for this kind of uh, application where we need, you know, it's a very uh, detailed model with so many parameters and uh, so many details in uh, number of hours or temperature, relative humidity, dew point, so on. So this, this kind of, uh, but anyhow, it gives you a, a signal for the uh, 2016. And maybe this kind of thing can have an application for other location, at least for uh, uh, disease suitability, okay? Whether suitability for a specific disease. Well, uh, another approach that we are in this work that uh, we are uh, doing is uh, maybe using a, a crop model, okay? A, do a couple, okay? model coupling, okay? A disease and a crop grow, crop grow model in this case. Uh, a wheat model, okay? We are using uh, models from uh, DSAT, okay? We were using N wheat. And uh, so we have this genetic disease model now that's parameterized to uh, mimic uh, wheat blast life cycle. And also have the model for the knock room. So the idea, and uh, we have the soil data, weather data, so all the inputs, and also we have uh, the genetic coefficient that needed for as input for this uh, uh, wheat crop model, okay, where they will have some uh, trials, uh, uh, multiple environment trials in Bangladesh with different cultivars, different soil dates, and uh, they do have this uh, very uh, complete uh, setup of uh, data set, okay, with uh, uh, canopy, biomass, phenology, uh, leaf area, okay, all these things that we need to, uh, to do this uh, genetic equations for the models. Okay, so uh, given that we have all this together, so we, the next step is to do this kind of uh, uh, coupling of uh, a wheat blast model and a wheat crop model. So in terms of that coupling, um, very, very simply, what we've been working on is the, is the coupling of DSAT, as Mauricio just discussed with the meteorologically driven um, spore cloud models and infection models that we've been working with that get coupled through an MPI. And then you can simulate on a gridded basis potentially yield reductions. And so we've been playing with this approach. We've done this in Brazil. Um, as you see here in 2015 in Brazil, there was a light outbreak of wheat blast disease over a large area, and we were able to mimic that outbreak. Um, in 2016, we ran the model when there was not an outbreak and we were able to mimic the lack of the outbreak. These, however, of course, are data that would be best validated with direct field observations as well, um, which, are, which are few and far in between in the Brazilian case. In the Bangladesh case, the disease struck in 2016 very suddenly, so it caught us all by surprise. We weren't able to react in time to actually go and collect the, the field data to assess yield reduction and incidence and severity. But we, using this approach, were able nonetheless to simulate the reduction in yield that, that occurred. And if you know a little bit about the disease and its, its area of impact in Bangladesh, the, and the, looking at the map that you see here in 2016, it does indeed approximate um, the, the area of infection. We ran it again, for example, also in 2018, which if you recall the previous graphs, graph that Mauricio showed was not a, a year of a high spore cloud density. And we found that there wasn't a yield reduction and that largely is confirmed with our own field observations um, of the disease where we found very, very, very little um, incidence or severity or, uh, and there are very limited reports of yield reduction with the disease. However, having said that, we do know that the inoculum is still present in Bangladesh, and we do know that if base temperatures get high enough in the winter season, um, there is a remaining risk of outbreak. So what we want next to do is move this to the point of being able to use it for an early warning system. And in order to do that, we've been working closely with extension and meteorological agencies in Bangladesh, and we've developed a warning system that integrates these models, and it pulls data from the Bangladesh Meteorological Department in terms of weather forecast information on a five-day basis. We receive currently that information on a 17-square grid, 
It runs it through these equations as we just discussed. It puts it into a server and then it moves directly from that server to transmit information in Bangladesh. And we've also run this in Brazil via email or text message directly to farmers um, in, in, and so, that, so that they can receive information. In Bangladesh, we've got currently 800 extension agents enrolled in receiving information from the system. Um, and we're aiming in the next year to increase that to more than 5,000. So we're prepared if there is a disease risk again in the future. But how does, the, how does this actually work in practice? Well, without going into a lot of detail, you don't want to just say disease is coming, but we want to be nuanced and say something about how the disease might strike. And so what the, mod, the early warning system does is it gives a reading based on potential spore cloud density, as you see here in the table, of low, medium, or high densities. And then we approximated ourselves when we think that farmers within Bangladesh may be at different phenological stages based upon expert opinion and the range of potential phenological stages for farmers that have started crop early or late. So these are estimates that are best guesses for those periods. Then within that, you'll see that I've put different letters and the different letters correspond to the, the kinds of warnings that will be emailed or text messaged to extension agents and or farmers based upon the level of risk and the anticipated phenology of the crop. And so what I want to draw your attention to here in the first one, for example, is that in A, there was a low spore cloud density and it was very early in the season. And so we said there's no risk of disease outbreak, so there's no reason to do anything and we don't even send a message. We don't transmit that message. Or for example, in period G, when the crop is nearly ripe and there is a higher spore cloud density, we send a much more detailed message that explains that the conditions have been right, right for the disease. And we advise farmers to take preventative action and consult with extension agents appropriately. Or for example, late in the season, even if you have a very high, high, high spore cloud, but you know that the crop is largely mature or pretty much ready to be harvested and removed from almost all fields in the country, we again decide not to send that message because it would not be economical for farmers to take preventative action because that crop is being moved off the field. So that's a little bit about how we've taken these approaches that included uh, models that were initially developed in Brazil, applied them to the case in Bangladesh, um, tried to do different methods of field observation and spore collection, use of secondary data, I ironically from from turf grass in Pennsylvania to, to validate the models, and then applying them with DSAT to look at yield reductions, but also taking that a step forward to developing an actionable early warning system. And Carlo, I think, will be presenting next um, that takes some of these approaches and blows it up to a regional level, which is really exciting also, we can, so we can look beyond Bangladesh and into other countries with a different level of sophistication, which complements this work. But to conclude, there's a few things we want to leave everybody with, which is number one, don't recreate the wheel. Um, a lot of this was possible because we were able to make connection with our colleagues in Embrapa in Brazil and start collaborating with work that they had already advanced and we were able to bring it to Bangladesh. We also found that the field validation work that we did and the spore trapping was really, really important to understanding the dynamics of the disease but nonetheless that yet led us to the tactical use of secondary data um, that we retrieved from these turf grass observations in Pennsylvania that we were able to use to validate um, the blast disease dynamics. The next point is that partnerships are absolutely key. So only in doing the early warning system with meteorological agents and extension agents is, is it possible, but one wants to keep it simple and deliver actionable messages that farmers can actually use. And last but not least, as a perhaps a taste of what might come in the future is that we've also started to try to collect data from Zambia, where as Diego mentioned, world uh, wheat blast is now being observed and started to play with the application of some of these approaches to look at the risks in Zambia. And we might with colleagues at CIMIT be porting some of these ideas there. But with that, I will conclude and say thank you, everybody, for listening. We look forward to the rest of the presentations and all of your comments. Thank you, Timothy, for this, and Jose Mauricio Fernandez for this great presentation. And the next one is Carlo Montes from CIMIT.
I'm sharing my screen now. Can you see it? Yes. Can you hear me also? Yeah, but the, it's a little bit unstable. So, but yeah, I hope it works. Okay, just let me know if uh, we have issues. Okay, okay, we'll start my presentation. Thank you, Tim, Tim and Mauricio for your presentation and your good introduction to my work at the same time. Um, I will present a, a larger scale uh, on continental scale assessment of uh, climate stability for wind blast in Asia. Um, I will present the, uh, a little bit about the motivation, objectives, methods, and data use, um, results in terms of spatial and time variability, drivers, and some comments about uncertainties and limitations, and some conclusions at the end. Well, it um, teams and Mauritius presentation already uh, show why wind blast is important as a as a crop disease today. This is a uh, disease affecting the, um, the spike of uh, wheat during the heading stage that can cause uh, partial or total grain loss uh, uh, up to 90% as has been reported for some countries. So this um, this disease has has been considered as a um, serious threat for food security in developing countries. In this map, we see how the disease has been spreading. It started in, in South America and then it here in um, Bangladesh and Zambia. It seems it's not following any biophysical, I could say, uh, pattern or drivers, uh, but cultural factors. But we know that the climate or weather is a major driver of fun fungal diseases. So the question um, for this presentation is how suitable are these background conditions for the establishment of wheat blast in Asian countries, considering um, both the high diversity of, uh, of uh, climatical or climate variability over this very large area, and also considering the importance of wheat as a crop for these countries. So always in, in the context of the development of climate information services, and this is, this is my, my work at SEMIT actually, um, the objective of this study is to provide a general overview of the spatial and temporal variability of climate suitability for the development or establishment of wheat blast in Asian wheat producing countries uh, with the aim of the, of the potential development of um, tools to address the potential threat or research iterations, risk assessments. That's the context of this study. The approach that I follow can be and classified in four, four steps. I use a generic infection model, um, a wheat phenology model, and I use large, this um, large um, scale uh, uh, data to force those, this model, uh, and some data for, um, to provide boundary conditions. The main output of the approach is the seasonal total number of potential wheat blast, blast infections, and I analyzed this, um, the model outputs, the MPI number of potential infection in terms of variability and drivers. Uh, well, the model is uh, it's a generic model that consider the uh, temperature response function with uh, cardinal temperatures uh, specific for every species of uh, fung fungi. Um, this uh, temperature response function is, up, is a scale to a wetness uh, response function. Uh, in general, when some conditions of humidity and temperature are met, we have an, an infection event. The model considers also the effect of dry periods in, in, on the development of the, of the fungal disease. Uh, I use uh, all three models since, since wheat plus um, infections occur during the heading stage of wheat. Uh, I, we need to know where heading happens. So I use the one uh, an angle model that it's a widely used analogy model implemented in many crop models. Um, so it, this considers the, the, the calculation or the timing of the phenological stages as a function of air temperature. And in general, it takes into account the effect of temperature, photoperiod and vernalization for winter wheat varieties, and only temperature and photoperiod for spring wheat. Um, 
the model forcing, um, it's with the ERA-5 reanalysis, only data, um, only data required for, uh, for crop disease modeling um, that can be a limitation sometimes. Um, so I use only data for this. This is the domain. The map, the map shows the domain um, from 1980s through 2019, almost 40 years of um, climatology of about 40 years. This is a 31 resolution product for 137 uh, vertical levels. I use, of course, the surface level. Uh, and it's a real atmospheric reanalysis. So it's a combination of observations and observations interpolated by a, using, using a physical climate model or meteorological model. And in terms of variables, I took air temperature and viewpoint temperature for the infection model. From those two variables, we can calculate the relative humidity and air temperature for the phenology model. These are the, the boundary conditions. Of course, not the whole domain doesn't have width everywhere. So I took the, the, the this spatial production allocation model for oh, where wheat is it's cultivated. I took production and tra transformed that into a, a grid uh, wheat presence. Also, crop calendars for planting dates from this wild USAC product. It's a, it's a product that it's mainly used for climate simulations, uh, and also in some regions like in India, spring wheat is cultivated in winter. So we need to know where spring wheat is cultivated or, wheat, or winter wheat is cultivated. So I use the product of Fitsumi. That's a, it's a, a product that provides the probability of having a specific crop. So I took probability of wheat, uh, winter wheat or spring wheat. This is the main, main result, in my opinion. Uh, it's a climatology of the number of uh, potential infections of wheat blast in South Asia. It's a it's long-term average from 1980 to 2019. Uh, we, we see that it ranges, uh, the potential infection ranges from, from no infections in North China. This is climate suitability, always driven by climate. And to high um, pressure of uh, potential infections of wheat blast, like, uh, like in North India, we see a hot spot of uh, potential infections in North India, in the IGP, uh, in Bangladesh. Um, it's, it's relevant because for North India, wheat is a very, very important crop. And this is the internal variety of total number of potential infections for each country. And we see that India has, of course, the highest value because it's a bigger, larger country. But if we normalize the potential infections by the total area infected, uh, with Bangladesh shows the highest pressure. Um, so the question for me is also, what is the relationship between the potential infections and climate drivers? I did this first analysis on, on, on as a composite analysis, taking the, the third percentile of number of potential infections for every grid cell, and the aggregated anomalies in temperature, relative humidity, and precipitation. There is not a clear relationship for, with, for temperature, except Pakistan and North India. Some areas, we see red areas with a uh, relationship between highest, the highest percentile of uh, infections and relative humidity. Uh, and no relationship with precipitation because it's basically the dry season in the continent. Uh, this is mainly due to the temperature response function is not linear. So we shouldn't expect that highest temperature is closely associated with highest and potential infections, but the water content seems to show high, uh, a better association. Similar, taking the climate anomalies, so this is the highest percentile of temperature and humidity, and the associated number of potential infections. And here we see that some regions in India, and in Bangladesh especially for humidity, so shows an association with climate. So the questions as well as what are the dynamical associated um, and atmospheric or climate factors. This is relevant because these anomalies in surface climate are always associated with global drivers like El Nino or the Indian Ocean Dipole that are two that are recognized as the main drivers of interannual climate variability over this region. So I took first the Oceanic Enso Index as um, El Nino 
or La Nina index, um, and we see that the Nino years have uh, associated positive anomalies of potential infections in red. The map uh, shows red colors. Conversely, La Nina years have uh, anomalies associated anomalies, uh, negative anomalies of potential infections. Similar for the dipole model, an index of the Indian Ocean dipole, we see the positive years of in this CMI index. Uh, are associated with positive anomalies of number of potential infections and similar for negative years. What we see in, for these two indices, first the El Nino and La Nina have associated a, lar a larger area of positive anomalies uh, or negative anomalies. And for DMI, for the Indian Ocean Pole, the, the area is smaller, but the, uh, the, the anomalies are stronger up to 25. So the question that I have now is how, if uh, if this this background conditions and climate, seasonal climate can be predicted at the seasonal scale. So this is an exercise um, evaluating um, general circulation models from the North American Multimodal Ensemble. These are hindcast means forecast of the past from 1982 to 2016 for five operating models. It means models that are currently providing forecasting in a, in a almost uh, real-time way uh, for Bangladesh and India. And so I'm, I'm evaluating now the, 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 the skills of these models in terms of the background conditions uh, or drives at the seasonal scale of, of uh, with blast infection. And some models and the ensemble mean seems to have some potential for predictability at the seasonal scale. And also, I want to comment on the uncertainties associated to, for modeling. Um, for those that are familiar, implementing and parameterizing models, you know that uh, sometimes the parameters are not uh, are, are very difficult to obtain by measurement or in the literature. So in my case, I, I wasn't able to find this D50, the duration of uh, dry periods, uh, the impact of dry periods on the development of wind blast. I unable to find a specific parameter for, for wind blast, but I took a range of values uh, provided by the author. The authors classified the, the different species in sensitive, moderate, and insensitive. So I took a range of value and run the model for this range of values. And it seems that there is a reliable range of values, at least for, for values for sensitive and moderate. Uh, so, there is, but it, this is something that we have to take into consider when we implement a model. Other sources of uncertainty is, of course, other parameters of the infection model, but I was able to find for wheat blast, but the D15, no. And also parameters for the phenological model, when this is a lar very large domain, so we have, a, the larger the domain, the higher the uncertainty. There are multiple, many re different realities and varieties, et cetera. And also that for, for, for wheat, that most of those parameters are generated for other latitudes, for so Europe, the US. So it, it's, for example, uh, it was difficult for me to find parameters for um, calibrated in, in, in Asia, in Asia or, so, or other countries in Asia. Uh, well, and other, other sources like uh, fixed planting dates that show this map of uh, crop calendars. Well, well, that's uh, also source of uncertainty. Um, some conclusions, there is a high spatial and temporal variability in the climate suitability for wheat blast over this large domain with a, a big hot spot of pressure in, in North India and in Bangladesh. There's a high variability as in this box plot uh, graph that I showed, uh, which means that maybe for some country or some region where some years there's not, uh, or, or the average is not, uh, is not high in terms of climate suitability, but maybe some years associated with maybe also with large scale uh, forcing, can, the pressure can be higher. There is a, a, a clear relationship with the uh, El Nino and, and the Indian Ocean Dipole indices, uh, which is, uh, I can say, Good news because the, this case of seasonal predictors for climate um, and the background climate for the development of uh, with blast. Um, as I mentioned, the El Nino seems to influence a larger area than the Indian Ocean dipole, 
but the, the Indian Ocean Dipole influence is stronger for this smaller area, stronger than El Nino. Um, and it seems to be some, some potential for the seasonal prediction of, of climate, um, of uh, seasonal climate, um, provided that some bias correction um, method is implemented for the general circulation model, physical, physical model. But the other, the other option that I'm about to want to, to verify or to, to work on is the empirical statistical forecasting of the number of potential infections, taking the model outputs and to see the, the statistic, empirical statistical relationship with the global drivers like El Nino, Indian Ocean Pole or other, other circulation anomalies at the, at the scale of the continent. Thank you. This is Thanks a lot, Carlo. Yeah, thanks a lot for this great presentation. Now, Simone, you are in. Thank you very much, Annabel, and uh, thank you all the attendants. I hope that uh, you are seeing my screen. <clears throat> Can you confirm? Yes, oh, yes thank you. we see. OK. Uh, first, uh, really thanks uh, to Diego and Annabel to give me this opportunity for me. It's, uh, pleasure to present uh, the work that uh, we are doing in the last years. I'm not speaking about wheat blast, so we change a little bit the topic. And uh, my presentation is uh, as a first part, which is uh, quite generic. Uh, I will go maybe, oops, the host has asked you to start your video. Okay. Ah, thank you. Okay. Ciao. Okay. So just move this here. So uh, as I told you, the first slides are quite generic, but uh, uh, also Diego has already said uh, many things uh, about the relevance of plant diseases in causing ill losses worldwide. And, uh, and it is a fact that uh, nearly none of the crop models that are currently used do not take into account this uh, coupling between the, the damage mechanisms due to the diseases and the crop physiology. So uh, what we see is that uh, the simulations that are currently performed to take a, um, to perform yield predictions, even in climate change scenarios, are bound to lead to overestimates. If we don't consider plant diseases and pests, we are overestimating the future yield. Uh, this is the same paper that Diego presented in the starting uh, part of this uh, uh, webinar, in which uh, um, uh, some colleagues, uh, Savary et al, in 2019, published this on uh, nature, ecology, and evolution. Here, just to give you an idea of the uh, different relevance <coughs> of the pests and diseases across the main uh, staple food crops. So the colors means that uh, depending on the area, the uh, specific disease can have very different impacts. And uh, they also found that the food, uh, food security hotspots are the most interested, the most affected by plant disease, uh, by losses by plant diseases. Again, this is a, a um, framework that we publish uh, in on, on food security. In on food security, this is just to give an idea, an idea of the fact that uh, um, also the um, let's say the contribution of the different diseases to food security. Uh, is uh, different and uh, requires a case-by-case -case evaluation. Here, we just took uh, some uh, examples with RAS and Fusarium head, bl head blight. And we see that even if they are, okay, the same, um, affecting a wheat crop, they can have different impacts on the different component, oops, sorry, different components of food security. Uh, this is uh, really need uh, before doing any modeling exercise to understand which kind of problem are uh, we dealing with. So uh, to um, say to further um, complicate the issue, we know that climate change can lead to very different responses according to different path systems. This is an old work that in which we use the same model uh, that Carlo presented, so the Magarai model for infection, and we can see that according to the pathogen, we can have the very different response in the future in terms of potential infections. This is a um, disease of sunflower, so no variation in the future with respect to the current climate. 
Then there is a Botrytis sinega, gray mold of grape. Here you can see a general worsening all over the EU grape uh, area. And uh, uh, on Phytophthora infestans of potato, here you can see that uh, in the northern region, the uh, pathogen will experience uh, um, bad, worse conditions with respect to current climate due to the um, increase of temperature and the reduction of wetness duration, basically. So here I will present you just uh, three case studies about epidemiological models. So uh, models that target the uh, pathogen bio biological cycle and uh, an example of yield loss models in which we couple some uh, damage mechanisms from wheat diseases to crop models. The first is on sugar cane. Uh, we focus on uh, orange grass disease, which is an emerging disease in Brazil uh, where we uh, did this work. The second is on hazelnut. Uh, we, I will present you an informative model-based system to forecast uh, yield quality. And uh, the third one is on rice blast, which is uh, very relevant in my country, so in Italy. Uh, the, there is a common workflow that we followed in these uh, exercises, in these modeling exercises. The first is to study the epidemiological cycle of the pathogen. We have to identify which are the components, the basic components of the uh, epidemic. And uh, we developed ad hoc new models. Either we developed uh, new models or we adapted existing model via parameterization. And I strongly agree with the, what Carlo said before about the need of uh, having reliable uh, parameterizations. And uh, in our case, we started from literature because this uh, disease um, caused by this fungus is not studied uh, very much. So it is uh, quite a newcomer in uh, Brazil. And so we had to rely on uh, literature. Uh, we uh, developed this model, which is uh, just uh, depicted here. There is no time to go into detail, but I will be glad uh, to uh, further in fact, this problem. Uh, on the right, uh, there is the results of the model in calibration and validation. So first model formalization that then have good data for calibrate and evaluate the model. In this case, we took uh, 605 field samplings in uh, um, Radopolis region, uh, state of Sao Paulo. And uh, we uh, needed to upscale the data from the field level to the uh, same spatial resolution that we need for uh, the simulation. This is another topic of this webinar, so data needs. In these cases, we used the uh, NASA Power uh, database, so uh, a mm, spatial resolution of uh, nearly 50 kilometers. And uh, here um, you see the projections of the model after calibration and evaluation on the main producing areas of the sugar cane in the world at the 10 day resolution. This is like a building block for a disease forecasting system. And here there is no coupling with a crop model. So briefly, I will present you, I will move on hazelnut. This project is carried out with the Ferrero hazelnut company. So it's an industrial company who needs data for their procurement. They need uh, in advance to know which will be the quality of uh, the um, yield in order to know where to buy, actually. So there is uh, this uh, rotten, which is caused by a complex of fungi in which the apporte is uh, dominant. We developed a new model in this case for this, taking into account the, the phenology of the hazelnut, because this, fung this fungi can enter in the, into the flowers of a hazelnut just in very specific moment. Then when the ovary is starting to grow, then there is no uh, further possibility of the fungi to infect. So we need to focus on very specific period. And, the, and this is why we, uh, we needed a good phenological model. Here, uh, just uh, the um, kind of data that uh, we used, we have uh, four years of data with around 100 sampling points per year. Uh, we uh, did the calibration only on 22 locations because uh, they, they were the more reliable according to uh, us. And then we apply the model on the other uh, orchards. And uh, uh, here are the results measured versus simulated. Just to give you an idea, in the, in, these are the main municipalities 
of uh, hazelnut production in Turkey, in the east and the west, there is a, a general model agreement despite some uh, flaws in some cases. And that's why um, uh, in a, an environment where we need to produce uh, timely information, we had to develop an automatic system to run these simulations, also taking the, into account of weather forecasts. So uh, we develop a very simple procedure to take into account the future weather. And uh, um, we uh, use the two sources of uh, weather data, both weather station and NASA power grids. And uh, we are developing a post-processing layer based on machine learning algorithm in which the classificators will be also grounded on the uh, typology of the management of the different orchard. We are also carrying out a sensitivity, sensitivity analysis to inspect better the model behavior because in the first test in 2020, we had some problems. The, our model overestimated the measured um, road temp. Last uh, spot is on rice blast. The same uh, concept, just to say that rice blast is a very important disease in Italy, which is the um, most, uh, it is the largest uh, producer in uh, Europe. So here we uh, develop a, a quite a new model, even if we couple some uh, other model for the different processes. For instance, for infection, we use the same model than Carlo presented. And uh, these are the um, two symptomatologies caused by leaf blast, so leaf and panicle blast. Again, uh, field experimental data on four Italian varieties in a three years experiment. And here, the most important uh, uh, variable is the host resistance. So we have in the rows very susceptible varieties and moderately resistant ones. We uh, include into the model these. Uh, um, this coefficient of resistance, uh, and we also simulated the rice phenology. So this is a, couple, a, a coupled disease and crop model. We evaluate the model also with the uh, observations taken at the municipality level in, before doing a spatialized simulation. Here, a completely different spatial resolution. We have two kilometers here, and also uh, the use of remote sensing to find the uh, crop sowing dates. And then we projected the model into in uh, under climate change scenarios. Here you can see just the main results. So we ended up saying that uh, uh, in the future, the uh, impact of leaf blast and panicle blast is um, predicted to be quite stable. And the major determinant of the variation in leaf losses and in disease severity is the resistance. Quite obvious results, but these are quantitative assessment. Last part. If I have still some time, is it? Yeah, you still have four minutes. Okay, so what I need to conclude here, uh, mm, I will present uh, just uh, the uh, last work that we did in the uh, PDMIP initiative, which is part of the ArcMIP network, in which uh, we mm, coupled uh, some disease damage mechanisms from uh, wheat diseases to uh, widely use the crop model. So the concept here is uh, quite uh, uh, well understood. So we have attainable yield given by a production situation. And then we have the injuries caused by pests and diseases that reduce this attainable yield to have actual yield. In this uh, uh, exercise, we took uh, uh, five models, this certain wheat, Hermes, SSM wheat, wheat pest, and Wofost. Actually, wheat pest was used as a reference model to uh, formalize uh, which are the damage mechanisms, which were then implemented into the other four models. In this case, since uh, according to our, our knowledge, at least uh, this is the first time when uh, a dynamic coupling of a disease and, and crop model is done in a, a, a let, let's say in a, um, how can I say, in a structured way, uh, we need to have a, a simulation protocol to test the uh, relevance of the different sources of uncertainty in simulating yield losses. So we tested five, uh, four diseases, powdery mildew, leaf rust, yellow rust, and septoria, different disease shapes, and different level of maximum disease severity. This is uh, under major revision of FICOPS research, so hopefully it will be published soon. Here, the main outcomes are that the, the uh, disease level plays the major role 
and this is quite obvious again, but uh, the main result, according to me at least, is that the model contributes a lot to the variability of results. So this means that the crop physiology, which is simulated differently according to the modeling approach of the uh, crop models used, has a huge impact also in the simulation of yield losses. And the last slide is on um, what we are doing in Italy right now. So we have a project in which we build a, a focus group with eight Italian regions. We are trying to couple different sources of information coming from weather database to in situ weather station, remote sensing techniques, and also using weather forecasts to project the model on a short term. And uh, we are um, developing a, a um, smart app to allow technicians and farmers to collect the data and put them into the cloud. This data will be used to automatically calibrate the model. And here we are developing with the strong interaction with the stakeholder custom dashboard to visualize the results according to their activity and also raw files for their report. And uh, this is just a very last slide, but I don't have time, so I just uh, skip it. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Simone, for this presentation. Um, I hope it was clear. If it was not, you have some questions, please don't hesitate to type them in the question and answer section. And now uh, the next speaker is going to be Jacob Smith from the University of Cambridge. Thank you. Hi, thanks everyone. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen. Yes, thank you. Great, uh, so thank you for the opportunity to present. My name is Jacob Smith, working in the Epidemiology and Modeling Group at the University of Cambridge Department of Plant Sciences. I will talk about our ongoing project to forecast wheat rust dispersal and infection across South Asia, including some of the challenges being tackled with our collaborators at CIMIT and the UK Met Office. So mapping onto several of the CGIAR research programs, this work is conducted as part of a project within the Asia Regional Resilience to a Changing Climate Program, ARC. Uh, in this initial 12 month pilot phase, we are pro proving the concept of modeling and advisory extension with a focus on wheat stem and stripe rusts in Bangladesh and Nepal. In the next phase, we aim to begin delivery of advisories to smallholder farmers and introduce uh, long distance dispersal modeling of wheat blast. Uh, an infection of wheat rust reduces the energy available to grow grain. This impacts crop yields and can even lead to total failure uh, for stem rust. Therefore, wheat rusts threaten, threaten farmer livelihoods, especially in less developed countries uh, and also affect global production. This problem has greater risks in countries where wheat is a major consumed staple crop, where production is growing and a high percentage of wheat is imported. Uh, these conditions are actually in, uh, in the case for Bangladesh and Nepal, so second and third most consumed crop in the countries. Production is increasing by about 10% per year and the imports are some, between 34 and 88%. So this is why we're focusing on Bangladesh and Nepal at this stage. Um, options for control. So one approach is to uh, develop and plant resistant wheat varieties. This is seen as a more sustainable solution. However, it takes many years to develop and adopt. A second approach is fungicide control. Uh, the main benefit is rapid response in season, but besides being arguably less sustainable, it comes with physical and economic access issues. Again, particularly acute in less developed countries. Uh, one key challenge to modeling wheat rust is aerial dispersal. This enables outbreaks and even persistent infection across seasons. An alternate host cycle exists, which can also be important for persistence across seasons. Um, so we're focusing on the, the smaller cycle, sorry, smaller cycle shown on the screen here uh, with the asexual cycle of wheat on urodiniospores. This is the larger cycle, which uh, can also uh, influence uh, persistence across seasons. Aerial dispersal has been implicated in extensive spread on the intercontinental scale. In the summary paper cited here, a number of historical cases of wheat rust dispersal are pointed out. So for example, from South Africa to Australia, uh, 
yellow rust uh, from Australia to New Zealand here. Um, there's also wheat brown and stem rusts traveling across the South Asian region and wheat yellow rusts across China, to name a few. So transmission of infection depends on a number of mechanisms connecting an infected and susceptible plant from an infected plant, the spore production, release, escape, and then within the air, the turbulent transport and possible loss of viability, and then deposition reaching uh, an infected plant with suitable environmental conditions. This project builds on an adapted particle dispersion model called NAME. This simulates these highlighted processes uh, where spores are sensitive to atmospheric conditions. Uh, as an example, here is a 3D animation of stem rust spore dispersal originating in South Pakistan on the 17th of March 2018 for the next 10 days. Uh, hopefully you can see this moving. So you can see spores extend several kilometers in altitude uh, and many hundreds of kilometers horizontally. So the black points represent each individual particle being simulated and the, the colors give an idea of the density of the fungal spore cloud. At first, the winds are directing the majority of spores eastwards, but later into the Arabian Sea. Uh, infection may take place where there is then substantial deposition of these spores. So seeing the same case, uh, we're now looking in the left figure at the deposition of spores over the same time period. So again, it's clear that there is long distance dispersal, um, possibly uh, extending the infection of stem rust in this case. So looking at another case study where there is a more extensive set of surveys across South Asia. We're now looking at stripe rust in March 2014. Uh, so there is a lot of variation in the deposition patterns indicating some of the complex influence of meteorology across the region. Um, and so moving on to uh, a look across the whole period of available wheat rust surveillance from 2011 to 2018, we get a broad view of spore deposition patterns for the different rust types. So here on the left, stripe rust, and on the right, stem rust. So stripe rust is extensive in central and north Pakistan, and similarly in India. Stem rust deposition is strongest in south Pakistan and west India here. In both cases, there is substantial deposition reaching Bangladesh and Nepal, and there are some cases of stripe and stem rust originating in Bangladesh and Nepal also. So to highlight the connectedness of regions across South Asia, we have isolated the sources of spores to each of nine regions, as indicated on the left. The top three panels show stripe rust deposition across the historical period from sources in Bangladesh, Bhutan, and Northeast India. The middle three panels relate to Northwest, South, and West India. The bottom three panels are for Nepal and North and South Pakistan. So these figures point to the need to consider sources as far as Pakistan to represent deposition in Bangladesh and Nepal. So the re regions eight, nine, and also four and six show s substantial amounts of deposition in Bangladesh and Nepal. And sorry, I didn't say this is for stripe rust. So looking at stem rust, the view is quite similar. While the strongest source locations are different, they still influence Bangladesh and Nepal, prompting their need to be included in any attempt to simulate uh, deposition in, in Bangladesh and Nepal. So one earlier success for collaborators was the setting up of a functioning early warning system of wheat rust for Ethiopia. There are a number of components to this. In red are surveys in field, from crowdsourced surveys and uh, through the EIAR central early warning unit in green, data is automatically passed to the forecast models in blue. Forecasts include environmental suitability for infection as well as spore deposition, enabling an estimate of overall risk of infection. These are provided to extension agents and smallholder farmers in the form of advisories and alerts. With this information in the, in the field uh, with this information in the field, uh, there is the chance to control the head of disease in key areas. 
uh, building on this success, forecasts have been prepared for Bangladesh and Nepal in the latest wheat growing season. These are generated daily for the next seven days for stem and stripe rusts. Uh, and I'll press play to show the one day ahead forecasts for leaf rust in Bangladesh. Uh, leaf rust, which is relatively less potent, but more common in Bangladesh. Uh, it was also requested and prepared within a matter of weeks. Um, and just to explain some of the visualization a bit more, the red points indicate uh, active regions of uh, we leaf rust infection um, and the colored, colored field, as in the previous figures, gives uh, an idea of the spores per square meter, so, sorry, yeah, spores per unit area per day. Uh, and now also showing the same view for stripe rust, but in Nepal, um, we can already see early in the season here, in the first half of February, there is an infect, uh, influence of deposition hitting uh, the southwest of Nepal which appears to be arriving from outside of the country. And over the course of the season, more and more cases of stripe rust are observed in the center and in the Southwest here. So I'll now highlight a couple of the challenges that have been tackled to enable a wheat rust early warning system in South Asia. Firstly, survey reporting needs to be consistent and prompt. Uh, to approach this, uh, we've used uh, an ODK mobile phone app. Uh, so firstly to say CIMIT have set up an international wheat rust surveillance strategy over a year ago, which is being used consistently in many countries of the world. And now instead of paper records, uh, the adoption of the ODK mobile phone app allows uploads to a single server, which can be accessed automatically and digested into model forecasts. And the images give uh, an example of the sorts of data which is being requested through the app. So another challenge is uh, the international coverage of unsurveyed areas. Because real-time surveys have been unavailable for some regions in the pilot phase, an additional challenge is representing these areas. This was particularly important in the 2019 to 20 season because of a large stripe rust outbreak in northern Pakistan and northwest India. Initially, we handled this by incorporating infection sources based on online news media reports. Uh, so, and this uh, identified a number of locations shown in the top of the images uh, where there were sightings of yellow rust in Pakistan and India. Initially, uh, we handled this by incorporating, sorry, yeah, so because of the intensive nature of tracking online news reports, uh, we then developed an automated media search tool which found the points in the top right of this slide. So there's some difference in spatial locations, uh, but the infections were generally reported in the same areas. The middle figures show the associated stripe rust spore deposition across January to April in 2020. And so the manual search and the automatic searches give a similar spatial pattern. The bottom row of figures shows the time series of source strengths for each region. Uh, so surveys identify stripe rust only in Nepal from the middle of February, so in the bottom left figure, so the red line is uh, strength of sources in Nepal, uh, and that's starting from around the middle of February. While for the media searches, stripe rust is seen in North Pakistan and Northwest India with the blue and green lines from, from the beginning or middle of February, uh, sorry, beginning and middle of January. This suggests a role for incursion of stripe rust epidemics into Nepal here. So additionally, the impact of the different uh, media searches is, is substantial on the number of spores estimated to be deposited in Nepal, so increased by 200 or 15% in each of the two scenarios. So the conclusions here are that while there's some differences between the intensive manual search and the automated search, key aspects regarding timing and extent are captured. So we are looking to implement the automated media scraping method next season. Uh, putting all components of the early warning system together, a lot of coordination is required. So this table is indicating some of the demanding aspects of each component of the early warning system. So for example, the wheat rust surveillance involves conducting thousands of infield surveys and logging via the ODK app. As mentioned earlier, this is carried out over multiple countries, which requires additional levels of collaboration. As another example, the UK Met Office Global Meteorological Forecast involves assimilating more than a million observations each day, 
computing 3.4 million model grid points over seven days. And all of these are performed by about 8,000 computer core hours each day. We, each hour even, we're using a one forecast per day, but they, they even compute it themselves every hour of the day now. Uh, another example, the wheat rust dispersal model involves computing about a million particle trajectories for each forecast. Additionally, the dissemination methods aim to reach over half a million farmers. Appropriate proven methods are being investigated in this concept, concept phase and form an essential component in the next stage of wheat rust forecasting in South Asia. So with that, I'll leave a summary of the challenges and approaches involved in the South Asia wheat rust early warning system. Just to point out a few things I haven't presented but are being explored further are aspects of wheat blast, long distance dispersal, representation of the host landscape and uh, further validation of the overall uh, forecast. So thanks for listening. So thanks a lot, Jacob and all the speakers um, today. Um, the presentations have been very clear and we have, uh, we have got some few questions, not many, so you still can type the questions in the Q&A, <clears throat> but we do have some questions um, to some of the panelists and also the speakers are free also to ask the other panelists uh, if they have some time. Uh, Diego, do you want to proceed with the questions or shall I do it? Sorry, uh, yes. can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so Annabelle, uh, is, are, are you um, asking the questions? The yeah, I can, I can, I can um, ask the questions. Um, so the first question is um, for Tim um, and, and Jose Mauricio. Um, and this is uh, the question is, uh, so many people say that your, your presentation, all of you have been very interested. So uh, the question is, in your modeling platform, is there interaction between adjacent grid cells to consider movement of disease partially, or is each grid cell based only on local environmental conditions? Um, I can start that, Mauricio, if you like. Um, then you can jump in. Um, but in the, the, the systems that we showed for Bangladesh and Brazil, they are currently at this point purely environmental suitability models. So within the uh, either the historical data, the historical weather data that's being looked at on a gridded basis or the forecasts that are also on a gridded basis, within that box, all that we are looking at currently is um, do the temperature, relative humidity and precipitation conditions um, function in such a way that it would allow spore development and or deposition and infection um, and, 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 and also the, the density of the spore cloud development. So that's all that we're looking at. So it makes an assumption that, um, that the spores are widely distributed everywhere. And that's actually one of the challenges and the problems that we have found, and that's why we started using spore traps. And a colleague, Harun, who was listening earlier, sort of led this effort. But we've used spore traps to examine the distribution of spores roughly in a north-south gradient across, the, across Bangladesh. And we found generally that in the north of the country, where the conditions are much cooler, um, there's few, if, if, if any, and often zero spores and further to the south, closer to the point of the original 2016 infection, um, we find more spores, but still also at a low density, but we consistently are finding them over three years of, of, of sampling so far. Um, that tells us at least that a, a little bit about sort of roughly assessing, you know, does the, are the models making sense in addition to data that we have from extension services and from our own field observations and otherwise about uh, how well things are working. But the validation really came from that turf graph data set that Mauricio showed with the, um, the spore cloud density um, dynamics. What's neat about and useful about the question that was asked is that this idea of having um, only looking at suitability but not looking at how movement of spores could move from one location to another and what the implications are 
were what actually brought us to having discussions with our colleague Dave Hudson, who's listening, and then also with, with Christopher and his group at Cambridge University that has sort of resulted in the work that, that Jacob presented, where we're looking at larger scale uh, identification of sources and then looking at the dispersion of spores and where they might deposit and then where they deposit are they depositing into a box that has those right and su environmental suitability conditions? So it's taking it a step further in, in that process. Um, and as I think Jacob mentioned, we're looking primarily at rust, but we've started the discussion about applying that also to wheat blast as well. Um, Mauricio, would you like to add anything? No, oh, I think you covered all. Okay. <laughs> so then uh, let's continue the questions on YouTube. Um, so this question is for Mauricio. Um, as you mentioned, there were differences in pathogen isolated from different species. Is that uh, related to weed or to weed species? Well, uh, we have done studies here in Brazil, in Spain, special at the University of Pisoza. There is one PhD student working this on sampling, sampling uh, uh, from uh, uh, any host, okay, that would uh, have us a region similar to uh, 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 blast, okay, on these different hosts. So either it's going to be a weed or it's going to be a, a cultivated crop like a brocchiari or a pepper, a forest crop, something like that. And uh, what we have found is that uh, we have been sampling within the wheat fields and nearby wheat fields and far away from the wheat fields. And uh, as we get uh, uh, the isolates from the wheat field and near the holes nearby the wheat fields, in general, they are very similar, okay, in gen the genetic profile. That gives us some evidence that there is something like gene flow, okay, maybe they are crossing even with the mating types in sexual stage, okay, so that's one hypothesis now that, uh, so that's why it makes these uh, so diverse, uh, the, the genetics of uh, Magna Portuguese. Good, I hope um, that was clear. And another question for you, Mauricio, is um, why sport traps are not widely used and are there limitations on the devices? Well, uh, <laughs> sport traps are very nice, okay? The only thing that they, they, okay, if you are going to do some uh, uh, observations, like you are going to take uh, trapping the spores and take the, uh, the spores to the, to the microscope and examine under a microscope, it's going to take someone with, with, with experience to recognize, okay, the particular type of uh, uh, spore, the species, okay, and also it's very time consuming. Okay, uh, so nowadays, okay, in some areas, what's, uh, what's a nice, very nice association is that uh, use of uh, spore traps uh, together with uh, uh, biological, biogenetic markers, like uh, you, say if you have a, a genetic marker for a particular uh, species or even a, a pathotype, uh, you can use uh, qPCR, okay, uh, and with qPCR, okay, you may have on, you know, just one day or a couple of days, you may have the results, okay? So uh, I think that's uh, maybe in the future, this kind of approach is gonna be, uh, although it's more expensive, but uh, it's gonna give you a, a better use of uh, these uh, spore uh, traps data. That's why in Bangladesh, we are trying to, to do the simulation, okay? Uh, using uh, uh, weather data, okay? Instead of uh, once we're gonna be we're confident that we can simulate uh, the number of spores in the air, okay? So maybe uh, we, we, we can rely on that instead of using the spore traps that is, it's, uh, it's expensive, it's time consuming. But yes, they are very useful. And then I'm gonna, this question is for uh, Simone. Um, and the question is, which pathogens show more sensitivity to climate change and causes more yield losses in wheat, mice, and rice? 
think it's for me because uh, okay to answer to this question i think that uh, we will need a huge uh, uh, modeling work i don't have any answer to um, to this question which is a very big one i think that uh, in order to answer to this question uh, what uh, is um, my opinion is that we should build a strong research network across science cities of different disciplines also because we need agronomists we need modelers we need uh, plant pathologists we need pure modelers it's a, a strong effort uh, that uh, um, of course if you find in uh, in literature you can find some uh, some uh, um, opinions about that in the papers from Savarie et al. in 2019, they also provided estimates of crop losses, but still uh, this work was based on online surveys, basically, uh, with the experts in the field. So I, uh, as we have uh, seen in this uh, uh, webinar, there is a lot of uh, interdisciplinary work to get uh, uh, to some results. and. Uh, uh, I would love to participate in such a network because uh, uh, we, we, we need to, let's say, to, to share knowledge and to build this effort, but I don't have any answer. And does someone from you panelists have some more like specific answer for this question? I, I would like to just mention that uh, Yes, yeah, some, some for, for, um, considering the approach that we use, um, for example, uh, my presentation and Simon's presentation, it's, um, is, yes, is the sensitivity of crop uh, disease um, outbreaks, for example, following um, the, um, some, some specific forcing for climate variables. I, I have the question on, on future predictions for South Asia, for example, but the other, the other part of the, the other side of the picture is that the projections sometimes or some regions are not very robust. For example, humidity in, in if you if we see projections for, of for humidity or temperature or precipitation in India or all these North India and Bangladesh region, that in, according to my results are it's a hot spot of, sensitive, of uh, climate suitability. The projections are very, very divergent. It's, uh, so it, it, sometimes it's not just to run a crop, a crop disease model with uh, future projections, but also to see is to, or to ask the question, if, is there any robust projection for a specific region? So, and that that's at the other part of the, the as a climatologist that, I can see that, that other side of the of the problem. In some uh, regions where projections are not very clear, we can check an average. We can say something, but the uncertainty associated with climate future projections of models or or scenarios is also very high. So it's a, it's a, it's not just to run a model with future projections. It's, a, it's a, the question is a bit more complicated. Um, thank you. Um, we don't have so much uh, more questions from the attendees. Um, if some of you, so probably we can start now, uh, start now the discussion panel, and you can ask questions to each other, or maybe Diego or Matthew Reynolds would like to introduce a topic that we can discuss. So if some of you have some questions, please go ahead. Thanks. Um, um, one thing I'd like us to think about is the, uh, what knowledge we have about the distribution of crops. So when we have a new problem that comes through uh, to us as epidemiologists, our first question isn't always about how does the disease or the pest spread, it's one of the first, but it is where is the crop, what's the density and what's the connectivity of the crop through which the pest or pathogen is going to be spreading. And time and time again, we, we, find, we use maps, spam and other sources, but I think we don't know enough about the distribution of those um, crops. And it's something that I think a group like this would be very good at um, coming together and looking at what have we got? What are the risks? And, and the thing that we do in our modeling is 
not so much how right can we be, but we ask a question, how wrong can we be? And we usually are wrong, uh, mm -hmm. but it is to challenge it and think, okay, are we wrong because we don't know where the crop is? And there may be stepping, so you have the disease here, you may have a stepping stone here that you're not allowing for, and then you're worried about what's happening over here. It's easy to ask a question. Yeah, can I can I ask? Would, would, that's a great point. And would you include in that a lack of knowledge about alternative hosts? Absolutely. So another way to think about it too is we tend to focus on uh, the, the crop area. We have a target crop area. And I think, again, it's important to think about, as we call it, primary infection that can be coming in from outside. And it may be literally outside, or it may actually be coming from an alternative, or in some cases, an alternate uh, host. Mm -hmm. I do think, however, we have to be careful not to let our models become too complicated so we haven't got a chance to test them. So again, sort of epidemiology we try to do, we use susceptible, exposed, infected, removed classes, uh, which could be for a whole field or whatever it might be, but relatively easier to test. But that, that's, testing is another issue. Over and out. I have a question for anyone who chooses to uh, try to answer it, and that is about, um, Tim, he, you might be a good candidate. So we saw the, the species jump with wheat blast, with rice blast. Um, can, can models help us predict that for other diseases based on what we know about uh, the epidemiology? Or is that a big black box? I'm, I'm not sure I'm the best person at, um, in, in the panel to answer that. I would actually refer back to Chris, who's probably got more experience and, and has thought about these issues. But that it, it definitely falls in line with the discussions that we're having. Um, because when, when wheat blast first arrived in, in South Asia, one of the biggest concerns that we had was, could it then jump to and live on rice? And then could it jump back into wheat? Um, so you have a continuous sort of green bridge of a major crop. And, and that remained a, a bit of an issue um, that still is under researched and understood because in contrast to the South American context where you basically have the wheat crop um, and less in terms of rotated crops, in South Asia, we have very, very intensive systems where wheat is grown, it's vacated from the fields, Shortly thereafter, rice is almost always planted and rice is pretty much the only thing that, at least in Bangladesh, that can be grown because we have such a high rate of rainfall during the summertime and the monsoon, and then you transition back out into wheat. Um, but so far we haven't seen that, but it's also significantly uh, an under-researched issue. What we did look a lot more for is um, trying to understand what some of the alternative hosts were. And our colleagues at the Bangladesh Wheat and Maize Research Institute did identify preliminary um, one or two weeds that are commonly found in rice fields, specifically, if I recall correctly, digitaria, um, that uh, showed signs of wheat blast infection and so on. Um, but we also did a large amount of additional sampling looking at alternative hosts in, in two sequential seasons and were unable to actually find strong signs of wheat blast um, on a range of different weeds that typically would grow on the borders of fields. Um, so it remains a little bit of an under-researched issue. But I, I guess I, I could bring the question back to the group though to, to think about because really what you're asking is an evolutionary question, um, more so than just a, a, a question of suitability and modeling and, mm -hmm. and um, deposition and infection, but it's really about the adaptability of the organism itself to different species, given the fact that, at least in South Asia, um, you, you could arguably have a selective pressure um, on the pathogen if it wants to survive during the summer season, because there's not a whole lot of alternative hosts, including crops other than rice that might be out there. But this is still one of the sort of big meta mysteries that I think that we have with respect to wheat blast. And again, in South Asia, 
it hit very strongly in 2016. It's been present since then, but at extremely low levels. And we don't know for sure that we're going to have another significant outbreak, but we want to be prepared. Um, I'll stop talking there, otherwise I get excited and start theorizing about things, but I'm wondering if any else has input on it, because it's a really rich question. Uh, can I, I, uh, may I come in um, just briefly, I hope, <laughs> briefly you hope. I, I'd say two things. One is you can't beat practical knowledge. And uh, I'm minded of um, Eugene uh, going, uh, Dave Hudson can talk about this particularly, about uh, Barbary as the um, alternate host for uh, rests and people thought there wasn't very much Barbary around until Eugene um, and others went in and started looking in Africa particularly and there it was a lot so you have possibility for generation of the sexual stage and then you know you have some more problems to cope with so that that's where practical knowledge really helps what about the the modelers I think we don't work closely enough with the evolutionary modelers. We in Cambridge have done some of this where we've looked at what are the evolutionary pressures towards specialization or generalization in relation to take all of all, uh, which is a, a soil bond disease. But more recently, I think, uh, well, more recently, I want to say we've been working on cassava, where cassava mosaic um, was a major disease problem. Some resistant varieties were brought in, but those then were actually susceptible to cassava brown streak as opposed to cassava mosaic. So we need to think, are we creating problems for ourselves? And also another indirect uh, influence is the effect on vectors. So the superabundance of white fly is in part generated by the reaction of particular varieties to the cassava mosaic, which can make them more appealing for the, um, the white fly vector. Now that's amenable to looking at evolutionary pressures and linking evolutionary modeling with epidemiological modeling. Again, over and out. Thank you. I think uh, Simona, you wanted to do a comment or answer a question. Yes, uh, but uh, in the meanwhile, I'm just thinking about uh, what uh, uh, Professor Gilligan just said, and I know there are there is some groups uh, working in uh, ATH, uh, Alex Taimika uh, who is uh, trying to, uh, and uh, his professor, I cannot remember his name now, who is trying to do such uh, an effort. So to um, introduce this uncertainty due to possible uh, evolution of the pathogen into these epidemiological models. I think that this is a really important. When we do climate change assessments, we should consider this. Yeah. But uh, my question was uh, for Jacob, actually, because uh, he um, showed uh, us a very uh, interesting work, very impressive work about uh, the movements of sport over the space. And I was uh, thinking, uh, of two uh, remarks. The first is uh, how transferable is uh, this model uh, to other uh, pathogens? And the second one is, uh, uh, did you try to translate, let's say, the um, pattern of sports into some uh, um, quantification of inoculum load to be then used in an epidemiological model? Right, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so in terms of transferability, uh, it's uh, it's readily transferable where we have good information about the the mechanisms that drive the dispersal. So in the case for wheat rusts, it's environmental conditions for spore release into the atmosphere from the the canopy or from the leaf, and its viability within the air. Um, it's been developed over a few years, so. Um, uh, and it's, it's being developed now as well for wheat blast. So I've gone through the process of adapting it and I can see that it can be done fairly readily. I think the challenges are generally come down to validating the result when actually some of the information that drives the dispersal are the very observations you might use to test it. Um, so we have to 
we have to think carefully about that. Um, and otherwise it's some empirical information. Um, yeah, so I mean, if there's any use cases you have in mind that that would be interesting to consider. Um, I think we're trying to modify the dispersal model so it's even more easily adaptable within the code base. Um, but yeah, happy to talk about any specific cases. Um, in terms of uh, translating the results to a sort of infection load. So we, we currently have an environmental suitability model for wheat rust that we also generate for the forecasts. And we do integrate these results over a period of time that we're interested in, whether it's forecast or a historical period, um, and form estimates of, yeah, uh, infection with an epidemiological model. Um, as it is, it's quite simple. There's lots of alternative aspects that we would like to test further, such as alternative hosts or primary infection besides the spores we know about. Um, but yeah, so that, that's in process. I haven't shown any images because I was focusing on the spore dispersal in this case, because that seemed like the, the new thing to contribute to this session. Um, yeah, I hope that helps answer the question. Um, we also um, got a question that maybe Jacob, you will be happy to answer is like, has the geographic information like natural landscape structure, urban structure between farms or buffering zones such as forests been considered as well in the model of spreading? Yes, okay. Uh, this is quite a technical point about the Met Office's meteorological forecast model. And as I understand it, they have a sort of land coverage uh, data sets, which uh, their model incorporates to understand things like surface roughness due to different vegetation um, and topology and topography. So uh, these things are all represented on the model resolution scale, which is a roughly speaking 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers. Things at a smaller scale have, have been parameterized where they, they've had data sets. So for example, vegetation and surface roughness um, on the farm scale, though, I don't think there's resolution at that level yet for their global forecast. But uh, I, if any, uh, I can always ask more directly with the team at the UK Met Office uh, if anybody's particularly interested in, a, in an aspect. Um, and I mean, this, this sort of feeds into some of the questions being raised earlier about how well do we know the, the host landscape um, and then the infection landscape. So in my presentation, I was pointing out that actually having an idea of the infection landscape is quite challenging and we're coming up with some different ways to do that um, where it's needed. And then host landscape, there's spatial variations and there's temporal variations. And map spam is really useful when looking at broad cases, uh, but there may well be opportunities with things like remote sensing data to improve on that. Um, yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll stop there, I think. Thank you. Um, some um, general question um, is whether um, these models are applicable for individual large farms. What will be the minimal area that can benefit from these kind of models? Okay, Chris. Anyone want to go first? <laughs> yeah, Chris, I think. Uh, Chris, we cannot hear. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, my neck is on the block. Um, I think I think we really uh, I know we really need to think very carefully about scale when we're looking at all of the the areas that we've been talking about today, and some of the models that we have heard about are decidedly happening at the large scale, and it would not make sense to uh, think about these at a very small scale. That takes us on, though, to thinking about, um, it's one thing to tell people they're going to have a, a, a disease, but what are they going to do about it? And then a big question for the modeling is, if I control the disease and my neighbor doesn't, what influence is that going to have on the success as you build this up into a region? So. Increasingly, I do think we need to think about the landscape scale and how 
farms uh, at ranges of different scales in here interact, but we have to adapt our particular models so that they make sense at the particular scales we want, I'm stating the obvious here, the particular scales we want to apply them to. I don't think I've said anything profound there other than I think this question of scale what meteorological scale um, are we thinking about? What dispersal scales are we thinking about? What do we know about the scales of the hosts and also, the, as, we, as I call them, the crops? And also, what about the behavior of growers? So do you get growers in one region doing more or less the same thing and different in a, in a different region? I think all of these questions we need to look at from the scale perspective. Could I? take a leaf from that and actually redirect the question partially to Carlo or to Jacob, because you're both meteorologists or climatologists. And there's also, you can explain it better than I can. But again, when we talked about the environmental suitability portion of these models, you're essentially trying to identify a grid in space and say, are the parameters within the grid suitable for the you know, deposition, persistence, and infection, and then sporulation of, 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 of a pathogen. And the smaller you go, if I understand correctly, and again, guys, please correct me, the more uncertain it becomes with respect to being able to at least forecast, in terms of an orally warning system, um, the suitability environmentally for that disease. Whereas if you back up, and you're using modeling approaches that allow you more predictive points than you are arguably, if I understand correctly, um, potentially more certain about your forecast. I'm wondering if you guys have anything to say on that, because when I heard the question, that was one of the you know, things that I thought about was, you know, as I said, in Bangladesh, as you guys know, we're using the 17 square kilometer grid um, because that's what's available, but what happens if you try to shrink that further or you increase the density of forecast points within the grid to improve the forecast skill, arguably? Am I making sense? Let me, yes, you're connecting uh, the ideas Sorry. very well. <laughs> yes, but because the, the, scale, the, the scale of the analysis is very important for the interpretation of the results. For example, in my work, this is a large scale with using gridded uh, products. And I analyze everything in terms of probabilities or anomalies, because these are the background conditions for the, for the establishment or development of the disease in a leaf area. So the processes are very well, they are related, but it's not exactly the same. For example, from a micrometeorological point of view, what happens at the height of a uh, weather station, for example, it's not exactly the same that is happening in the, in the plant environment. You know, the gradients of wind or, or momentum transfer or all the processes that are happening there in, the, in this very, in the, the shallow layer of the atmosphere are, are very are variable. You know, the vertical gradients are strong. But if we take the processes, it's something that is happening at the leaf scale and the weather scale or the climate scale in a probabilistic way or anomalies or composite analysis is very likely that the years of higher relative humidity or temperature anomalies will be related, you know, close to what is happening, we can observe in the plants, but it's not exactly the same. So the, the scale and the scale, if uh, we need to consider the scale of the study or the data or and everything for the interpretation of the results. So in, in my case, it's, uh, it's like that. So, so this is what I have to say. Uh, and if, uh, yeah, so this is a really important thing to think about. Uh, if I might add a little bit, uh, sometimes we think about it as taking it in the other direction. What if we broaden the results we have? Maybe these days people talk about having a 17 kilometer resolution or a 10 kilometer resolution or something, but what if we actually average our results over a much larger area and say a whole country? You know, technically you're using more information to build that and that might give you a more certain it gives you a bit more confidence about the value you're you're using because you're averaging over some variability there but actually it's not useful necessarily at a large scale if you were to say a, a whole country is expecting a certain level of say a particular crop infection that 
that's not necessarily something to work with. So yeah, um, I mean, there's the scientific aspects to work out how you can represent the different levels, but then actually, yeah, the, there's a useful level. We have to consider how useful it is as well. And sometimes being more detailed, it, yeah, the, the model can't be useful at that level, I think. If I, if I dare speak again, it's just something I was working with one of the team on earlier on today. It's when when you produce risk maps for a country, and this this was again a, um, a cassava disease, a virus in uh, West Africa. One can produce risk maps, but and you run a, a simulation many many times, so you've got lots of these stochastic realizations. But to pick up uh, on what Jake was saying there. In fact, you can end up smearing your risk map so that it's actually not very useful for people individually on the ground. And we need to think of alternative ways in which we can feed through the more localized risk as, to, uh, as opposed to the, the regional risk for those areas. I think there are ways to do this in terms of looking at the, the histograms for the distribution of where you're likely to have uh, an early infection or a late infection, is it likely to be big or small for particular regions and extracting that from the information. I'm sure others of you have seen this problem of smearing out too many stochastic simulations. I have, I have just one, one comment, uh, comment question about the, the, the earlier discussion. Uh, about this uh, aspect of minimum data requirement for crop and disease modeling, we know that uh, for field uh, research, we have uh, data and some of the aspects were already discussed uh, for the upscaling the, the results. But uh, in your opinion, it's an uh, open question for everyone. Uh, what, what aspects of data are still limiting large scale simulations? So could you name variables and other uh, aspects of data that are uh, that are available for few few trials, but limit most large scale simulations. I, I saw that uh, Carlo already commented in some aspects of weather data, like humidity for some areas. But could you could you name like other aspects? Well, now there are products providing and models and reanalysis providing multiple variables. There are, um, for example, meteorological models provide variables that I don't even know what they mean. <laughs> there are many, many. One of the limitations that I've seen in the literature is the time resolution. Um, because the, the, one of the advantages of the era five reanalysis, for example, for larger scale simulations, what is a last generation reanalysis released last year, I think. Um, and it provides only data. And for, for crop disease, you need high time resolution data. Most of the products provide uh, daily data at the best. Um, so, but, um, but you need a very, very um, uh, high resolution in time to, because the, the, because the crop diseases are like that. You, 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 some, the conditions are there and you can have the outbreak of the disease from when, when the, the pathogen is present in the field. So that's a, it's a limitation that I found in the literature when, when I see, for example, um, um, studies uh, running models using monthly data or daily data, that is not, not enough you know, in terms of resolution. So for large scale assessment, in my opinion, it's, uh, the, the variables are there, but not all the products are provided at the appropriate resolution. Okay, and in a space, okay, we can have from from very high resolution, uh, for example, one kilometer for a weather for a regional um, meteorological model run, to degrees of a uh, of some reanalysis or or GCM outputs for to projections and and, and historical um, simulations. Uh, we already discussed about the about the problems or the interpretation of results for, for different scales, different, resolu different resolutions. But in my opinion, the time resolution it's, uh, is very important. And well, all the data seems to be appropriate. And now we have products available 
publicly available at uh, that resolution. So th I think that that's uh, uh, beyond the, not only the variable, but the, the quality of the data and the resolutions that are available are something to consider for this kind of studies of, of crop disease, maybe for phenology or other application of modeling in the agricultural research uh, area. Uh, well, we can use other, other data, but, but specifically, specifically for diseases, we need a high resolution in time. That's my opinion. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we are already uh, on time. I don't know if someone has some short comment or if we have to, or if we, or we can end the session already. I, I'd just like to thank everyone. Fantastic uh, presentations and good discussion. Really nice effort. Well, yeah. good job of organizing it, Diego. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so thank you to um, all the speakers and also thank you to all the attendees for making until here. It has been two hours of very interesting presentation, very interesting discussions. If you have not done so, please uh, remember to join the convention that has just started. Um, we also have two other uh, sessions, uh, like in half an hour, we will start another session. Uh, you can register here with this link I sent uh, to the chat about phenotyping and remote sensing to facilitate minimum, minimum data set requirements for crop modeling. And also during the convention, we have organized two um, sessions, one about machine learning and crop modeling, another about grid, uh, grid crop models. So again, thank you very much. And I hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye to everyone. Thank you for being here. Thanks very much. Thank Bye -bye. you.